I want to thank you all for being here today, and I want to thank our speakers for being here, and uh, also for Carol uh, McKinney and uh, Thomas More College for hosting this event. Uh, tonight's topic is going to be specifically about CACR 26, which is a question on the ballot uh, this year. And there are many people that have questions about the uh, CACR 26 and, and how it all came about and why we need this, this uh, amendment. And uh, we have some speakers here to my right. Immediate right is uh, Representative Paul Mursky, who is the prime sponsor of this uh, constitutional amendment. Uh, you can raise your hand. Yeah, <laughs> okay. And from that point on, Rep Representative uh, Mursky also is on the uh, uh, Fish and Game Committee. No, uh, Legislative Administration and Chairman. And, uh, All right. I was Chair of the District. Okay, and, and Representative uh, Itzi uh, to the next of them. I'm gonna, what, what committee are you on? Constitutional Review and Statutory Lease Application. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> uh, Representative Sorg, to, to his right. Yes, I'm, I'm Vice Chair of that very same committee. Right, and I'll just uh, an added a an added note. Uh, both those state representatives also uh, have come and sat on the, the uh, redress of grievance committee as well from from time to time. And to the far end, uh, Representative uh, Paul Engbertson, he's my chairman of the redress of grievance committee, and uh, he's done a very good job, and we're very proud of him. And uh, and uh, so, without any further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Representative Mursky to start this this program off to talk about uh, the history of the courts in, the, in, the, in our Constitution. And so, Representative uh, Mursky, would you mind coming up? Yeah. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I would have liked to have been chair of fishing game. I, that's what I would have preferred. And my speaker asked me to chair legislative administration and then asked me to chair the special committee on redistricting. So. I got a lot more work than I'd really bargained for running for office last time around. Look, the deal on uh, the second constitutional amendments on the ballot, which is called CACR 26, but it's really number two on the ballot, has principally to do with restoring the fundamental right of the people uh, to oversee their judiciary, which we lost as a consequence of passing a different constitutional amendment back in 1978, which is in your constitution referenced uh, as Article 73A. Now, I'm not going to get into too much of that part of the debate with respect to the meaning and so forth, but I want to give you some history because we've got some terrific constitutional scholars here that uh, can take off on this and really, I think, help you a lot with the understanding. But I want to give you uh, sort of a layman's perspective on the Constitution, which I think is a correct way to actually look at it, understand its meaning, and interpret what every one of the articles means. When I was first elected in 1994, in December, <coughs> we're brought in on Organization Day, we take the oath of office, and the oath of office is to, to, to defend the New Hampshire Constitution and the United States Constitution. To tell you the truth, I never read the New Hampshire Constitution. And so I thought right after that that I'd better find out what it involved primarily, because obviously you can't take an oath without swearing fealty or fulfilling your oath. So that's what I did. And, and uh, what that leads you to is this. What you're looking for is meaning in every one of the articles and phrases. And if you're familiar with the federal constitution, which I was familiar with, I'd read all, all kinds of, all of the historical documents that affect the federal constitution, and I was particularly fond of the Federalist Papers, and I liked... Uh, I, I like the history of that period. I even grew up in a house where a fellow who built it fought with, with uh, John Stark at Bennington, a guy named Dudley Gilman. He was a sergeant at the ba that battle. And my brother and I found a bayonet in our house, I remember, when we were kids, which we sharpened up, which the antiquities, <laughs> which, <laughs> if you watch Antique Roadshow, that's the wrong thing to do. <laughs> in any event, uh, so it's been a, that was a subject that I've always been fascinated with. <clears throat> What happens is when you, oh, and with respect to the New Hampshire Constitution, and you begin to read New Hampshire history, you find some unusual things about New Hampshire that really have not been published anywhere. And uh, after you think about these things, you wonder what is going on in the colony, in the province of New Hampshire, at the same time that we're reading all of these polemics out of Massachusetts and further south. And uh, you discover, first of all, then New Hampshire is the place where the first shot was fired in the Revolution. It wasn't Concord, Lexington. 
It was fired at uh, Fort William and Mary on December 14th in 1774. And the first and most important Paul Revere ride wasn't from Boston to Lexington and Concord. It was from Boston to Portsmouth that, 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 that same month. He rode two, two days in a, in a snowstorm, sleet storm, terrible weather, to advise the Committee of Safety in Portsmouth that the British had set sail out of Boston to confiscate the powder at Fort William and Mary. And that led to a group of uh, alarm going up in the locality. 400 men gathered at the fort. A couple shots were fired. Nobody was killed. There were only seven men in the fort. But uh, they, the crowd prevailed their neighbors who were guarding the fort to let them in. And they confiscated all the powder the first day. And they uh, took the weapons the next day. And it's said that there were barrels of powder in all the congregational churches in the Seacoast area, which is where they were hidden. And just an amusing thing, <laughs> In addition, when the pilot who directs these, the, the, directed the British ships into the harbor brought them in, he got them stranded on a sandbar, which made it kind of hard for the British to do much about the insur that momentary insurrection. So the first, fire is higher, first shot is fired four months, actually almost five months, before the Battle of Concord Lexington. Next, you learn, is that in June, John Stark had more men at the Battle of Bunker Hill than Massachusetts did. He brought 1,200 men, 1,250 men, to fight on the beach at Bunker Hill. He saved the, 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 the Massachusetts contingent that was on the top of the hill in the retreat. Uh, why does New Hampshire have more people at Bunker Hill than the province of Massachusetts, or the province of Connecticut, or the province of Rhode Island? Why? You ask yourself these questions, or Connecticut. You ask yourself why. The next thing you learn is that in 1776, in 1775, the Continental Congress told the delegates to the convention, go on out and form, write your own constitution as soon as possible. New Hampshire is the first province out of the box, the first colony, to write a constitution in January 1775. That's what, seven months before the Declaration of Independence. Why is that? How can that be? And then what you'll learn is that once the fight moved south to uh, New York, and then to New Jersey, and then on south into the Carolinas, this, this uh, great war. In New Hampshire, during all this time, when the entire region, entire, entire North America is in conflict, what are they doing in New Hampshire? They're rewriting their first constitution because they, uh, they felt it was really, way, it was way too uh, autocratic and that it ought to be more egalitarian. And I, I don't know, Dan could probably tell you how many times it was submitted for review by the people, for, but for the, virtually the entire duration of the war and then beyond, they were arguing about what kind of government they were going to have here. A bunch of constitutional conventions, a bunch of submissions for votes. We were the first constitution in 70, to have a constitution in 1776. We were the last one to actually adopt a constitution in 1784. I think that's correct. Dan, Dan can correct me if I'm wrong. So you say, what is going on here that this colony would take this so seriously? And what you learn, I think, from looking at the history of New Hampshire, that we were quite different from the beginning. This colony was established as a commercial venture out on the Isles of Shoals, Gosport. And from the beginning, that's what it was, a commercial venture. New Hampshire was never a religious venture. And then as time moved on and as the colony grew, it became a real estate venture, still commercial. I read a book uh, once by Bernard Balin having to do with the peopling of North America where they came from and what they're, where, where, where they went when they got here. And I was startled to learn that, there are, that in New England, the folks who came to live in New England actually came here with money in their pocket and the ability to buy, buy land, which was not available to them really in England, right? But they were able to somehow gather resources, borrow, borrow resources, come over in ships and acquire property. So property rights became very important, were very important the motivation there. You get to the middle part of the country around New York, you discover there are lots of indentured servants, people with no money, came to New York and, and became involved as laborers or indentured servants to earn their way, to find some way to earn money to eventually buy property. And when you get down into the Carolinas and the southern regions, you find that there are large plantations which are large land grants by the king. So you have three different constituencies. So when, uh, when uh, uh, I have to be careful about time, but when when, uh, um, the, when, when you read the polemics of the era and you see what Sam Adams wrote, what John Adams wrote, what they talk about is really locking ideals having to do with rights of property, these a batch of individual rights which actually become the first part of our Constitution. When you get down into the middle, middle uh, colonies, you find that 
Thomas Paine's ideas about individual liberty were the ones that really caught people's imagination because they had no property, but they were individual, interested in their individual liberty. And way up here in New Hampshire, as I said, at the very end of the, this long train of colonies, out really in the wilderness, we have an extremely uh, large population of Scotch-Irish who come to this colony. They're devout Lockeans. They believe in virtually everything John Locke wrote, uh, debunking the divide and right of kings, etc. So what we wind up with is a really, really unusual and unique constitution, different from all of the others. This is the only constitution in the country that really begins with the Bill of Rights, an egalitarian Bill of Rights. Before they even talk about how they form government, which is what the United States Constitution is, it's a description of how government is formed. We start off with a long litany of rights, I think there's 38, 39 now, that we've added to the Constitution. And only, they've exhausted, only after they've exhausted themselves they, do they talk about what kind of government, how government's going to be operate, what the executive will look like, what the judiciary will look like, and what the House and Senate will look like. That's pretty interesting. You can't do anything in the, in the legislature without thinking about this long litany of prescriptions at the beginning of the Constitution. So when you think about <coughs> this and you read the document, what you discover is that this Constitution is very egalitarian. It gives all the power to the people. It gives virtually no power to the governor. And it gives no power to the judiciary, except that with respect to judges, it, it places ultimate confidence in their, in their discretion with respect to running their courtrooms and determining the outcomes of cases. But it doesn't create a judiciary in the sense that we have, for example, in Washington with the Supreme Court and all the apparatus. All the power goes to the people, and that's why, and not only that, but because it's so property uh, driven, property tax driven, uh, what you find, and I'll tell you why that is, uh, you find that uh, um, the laws and structures are really aimed at, well, they aren't aimed at property, I just said it. Most of the towns were developed after 1761 at the end of the uh, um, French and Indian War in New Hampshire come after 1761 because the interior of this state was uninhabitable due to Indian Wars from the very beginning, from, 17, from 1630 on until, 16, until 1761. That was continuous Indian War in the interior. The French and the English used the, used the tribes to vie for power in, the, in North America, and it was you know, simply unhealthy to live in the middle of the state. And if you want to read your history, you'll find all kinds of stories of abductions, individuals taken to Montreal and ransomed and brought back. The story of Hannah Dustin is all about that. So in 1761, we had a very, uh, we had a governor, Benny Wentworth, who was very interested in making some money. He turned New Hampshire into really the Florida of the, of the 18th century. The entire state went up for sale. He, I think he chartered maybe 70 towns, something like that. And in every town, there was property that was even given to churches or municipalities or to, the, or to Benning, Benning Bentworth himself. So he stood to make a great deal of money. And these towns were in corporations. So they were business corporations where there were partners. And those partners had to conform to a contract with the governor. They had to produce a community. If there were, and, and they had to have a town meeting very shortly in order to justify their existence. So all these towns had investors who had a commercial interest in their future. And the Constitution reflects in the number of members of the legislature the interest of all of these individuals from these towns. What the legislature wanted was, and what the people wanted, was to have their town, their investors represented in this legislature. And in fact, the idea of, of town legislation, uh, town, town representation in the assembly in the 1760s, probably because of this great new movement toward development, caused the towns in the seacoast to petition the king to, to be relieved of this power that the governor had, which was the ability to veto any individual that a, a community chose to serve in the colonial assembly. Three years after that petition went to the king, it came back with a denied, basically, on it. And it infuriated the small towns, it infuriated the investors, and it became probably the principal uh, uh, motivator for all of those things I mentioned to you earlier, the first shot, the number of people at uh, Bunker Hill, the first constitution, this huge debate throughout the remainder of the war over the form of our own constitution. <laughs> so what I want to leave you with in this initial kind of introduction is this. This state has always been interested in, in individual liberty, in the preservation of property, in uh, 
community right, the, the, the importance of small community government, individual represent, and, and that the power in this state ought to reside with the people and not with the institutions of the judiciary and, uh, and the executive. And one last thing, to just emphasize that, go back and read your history of Massachusetts about the time that John, uh, Sam Adams was beginning to write his polemics and look into John Hutchinson, who was both the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, vice governor, lieutenant governor, excuse me, and the uh, chief of the Supreme Court in Massachusetts. Look at the corruption south of us, and it will tell you a, good de a great deal about why our Constitution looks so different from anyone else's. I think uh, I'll get uh, Dan Etz up here to talk to you about uh, uh, this in maybe, maybe a little bit more detail. But that's the, way, that's the way the playing field exists as I see it in 1784. And then you can kind of, you'll see where this develops from that.